In our social newscast today with me, Sam Marshall, we have a chat to Kerry Lee Pascal, who is an executive trustee at Nation Builder, along with Klen Giwe Piri, product and community manager at Nation Builder. And we take a look at the impact management reporting guideline, which is set for a virtual launch on the 25th of March. Now, the impact management reporting guideline is an 18th month collaboration between nearly 100 social investors and non-profit organizations. That's our social newscast with me, Sam Marshall. Kerry Lee and Lengiwe, thank you very much for joining me. Kerry Lee, can you unpack the role of the impact management reporting guidelines for us? Yeah, so the impact management reporting guideline um, was birthed about just over two years ago when we were in a collaborative session that we ran at Nation Builder. Um, and part of the discussion was around how the not-for-profits often report in different ways, specifically around budgeting. And so because people are reporting quite differently and treating their financials differently, it's quite difficult to um, compare them with one another. And it's not only when it comes to financials, but actual impact um, and how to report on impact is um, something that everybody treats quite differently too. And I think your funder community knows that they often look to the financials primarily instead of looking at the impact report primarily to see if an organization, how, how well an organization is doing in the impact journey. And so we realized that there's a huge need for us to look at a way to start, take the first step in the journey, because it's a very long journey to standardize an in industry, but taking one step in the right direction to start standardizing the way that we report at least. But there's aspects of reporting that we are aligned on so that we are treating our financials in a similar way and that we are treating the way that we put together our, our reporting in a similar way. And in that, starting to move towards a place where funders can start actually seeing where impact is um, taking place and hopefully um, putting resources behind um, entities and projects that are truly having the greatest impact possible. Kerry, just as a follow-up, one could argue that this report has always been important. But in 2021, this report is even more important because we just come out of a harrowing year. We've really had mm. to dig deep as organizations, as both public and private sector. Almost overnight, we've had to change our systems. So this report, in actual fact, is really critical to map a way forward. Absolutely. I think um, we've seen an increase both from the not-for-profits and the donor community. There's a desire to truly understand impact. And the more we can understand what is and isn't working, um, the more we can put our resources strategically behind things that are working. Because the reality is the need has increased. It's ballooned on us. And the amount of resources available have decreased. And, and that is because there's been a huge financial strain on many of the corporate social investment entities, many of the philanthropic trusts and foundations. And so there's less resourcing available and more need. And so it's really important that we identify where the greatest impact is taking place and how we can really help move forward in our nation um, as a collective force. Thank you. Just to bring you into this conversation, now the guideline is the result of an 18-month collaboration between nearly 100 social investors and nonprofit organizations. That's in the nation builder community to create a shared solution that meets the requirements of all the parties. But it also happened six months before we even heard of COVID. Did that have an impact on the report or kind of the output of the report? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, you know, I mean, COVID hit just as we were preparing to finalize and launch the impact management reporting guideline. And our community was undoubtedly dealing with a lot of more pressing and imminent issues during that time. So we did have to pause the project for just enough time for our partners to find their feet amidst the pandemic. But interestingly enough, we soon saw that they were quite eager and ready to continue on the impact management conversation. And the pandemic really has reinforced the importance of effective practices, as Kerry said earlier, within particularly the impact management space. So we simply don't have the luxury of not getting things right, considering the vast need and the limited resources that are available. So we really are seeing a a renewed commitment and desire to have impact management reporting done right so that we can really get to the bottom of some of the ills that our society is facing. Kerry, maybe just to get your insight as the executive trustee of Nation Builder, just that kind of shift 
this started 18 months ago. A couple of weeks ago, we commemorated the or reflected upon the first, it was a year that COVID has been with us. This report in actual fact started ahead of COVID and then kind of worked its way through COVID. And to Tlengiwe's point that your members within your community had to deal with something immediate and then come back to this report. But how, from an executive level within Nation Builder, did you guys reflect on the, the role of this report and kind of what's happening on the ground? Yeah, so during um, COVID, we realized that the imminent need was around collaboration and communication about what is and isn't working. So um, that is why we paused the impact management report um, during the COVID season, in the beginning of the COVID season, and actually started um, sector-specific collaborations where we had multiple Zoom calls with not-for-profits and the donor community where they were trying to understand what is happening on the ground, what are the best ways that we can partner, um, how can entities across the country partner to not um, multiply or not to not um, duplicate efforts in any way. And so um, that became a large focus for us last year. So we, we took a strategic decision to really shift our focus to that last year because that was what the sector needed. Um, but as we've moved from crisis mode into a mode where the sector is starting to re recover and put um, systems and structures in place to try and build towards the development process that is going to take our nation forward, we are now seeing that this impact report actually has such an incredible role to play because of the amount of collaborations that are actually taking place. So I think something that we've seen with COVID is that the not-for-profit community is really looking at how they can collaborate with one another, um, as well as the donor community, to be able to have the greater impact with the reduced resources. And so it's essential that people report in a similar manner, because if you're collaborating, um, it's important that you can actually start understanding um, what your role is versus somebody else's role and what the impact is of your collective efforts. And so this really has been um, an exceptionally well-timed endpoint of this project. We obviously um, didn't know that COVID was going to come, but we do feel that it's going to support the sector um, in the season of um, rebuilding and in a new way um, post-COVID or sort of once while we've been in COVID for long enough for us to be able to start coming up with a strategy on how to work together around it. Thank you. With the standardization of measurement tools, the look at how to develop effective strategies based on quantifiable data, this report is really going to speak to those issues and both you and Kerry has talked about it. Put us in picture at the moment. What's the quality of the current data? You know, it's very difficult to comment on the quality of the data we have on impact management at the moment. There's just simply so many methodologies and frameworks and indexes available, but not many that are necessarily contextualized within our setting, both as a continent as well as as a nation. And this is why projects such as these are so incredibly important, that as we begin to interrogate how we see and measure and report on impact, um, we begin to pull together and grapple with these questions as a sector, and we're moving closer to having more of a deep and an accurate picture on the quality of the data. So this really for South Africa is kind of more the beginnings of a broader understanding of the real quality of the data that we're having, as well as then an idea of the impact that we're having on the ground. Just as a follow-up question, because as somebody who is reporting on some of the, the interventions that's happening in this space, you're a product and community manager. I can only imagine that when you are engaging with a hundred social investors, um, non-profit organizations, while putting this report together, you're having so many different conversations. Is there an understanding, and I mean, I'm sure that a lot of it will be unpacked in the report, but is there an understanding amongst those that, you've, that you were engaging with that a standardization of measurements, access to quality data, putting a process in place is important? Or did you find, honestly, a little bit of resistance or a lack of understanding? So in my engagements with the community, it was really apparent that this is quite a, a big need for the sector. So there was quite a, a desire for standardization. When it comes to an understanding, we, there's just simply so much out there that people are, are struggling to understand how this fits in within their particular context. Um, and especially when you look at the various sectors that are involved, I mean, indicators for food sector and for education, 
um, related programs. And even if you look at education specifically, is it ECD? Is it is it higher learning? There's a variety of different sectors that are available or that people are having programs on. But it's very difficult to understand what indexes should I be using for my particular program? What is relevant for the programs that I'm running? And that's not even just from a international perspective, but also just from a variety of things that are available. So how do I actually select matrices for my project? So a lot of people have asked for, can we just pinpoint not just to a library, but what is relevant for us as a, as a nation um, and as sectors as well? And so this is really a big conversation. Um, so yeah, there's really a desire. Standardization is going to assist us. It's going to help people to report more effectively, but also help them design their projects um, in a more intuitive manner as well. Kerry Lee, I'm fortunate that I've seen the report, but there are a couple of things that you identify. And the ability to quantify one's social impact, if you consider stakeholders that want your words, efficiency, consistency, value, and quality in terms of the social impact insight, where does that leave organizations who are operating on old ways of thinking or or even just running their institutions? Hmm. So I think there's many approaches to social development that have worked for many years and still work for many years. Um, so in no way do we anticipate that people change the fundamental thinking around development. But we do hope that this report can truly amplify the work that people are doing um, so that people can get just better insight into um, what is working in my organization when I look at that compared to somebody else who's doing something really similar to me. How can we how can we share notes with one another and actually build on our strategies and continue to be learning organizations? Um, I mean, the big dream, and that's not where we're at at the moment, but one day it would be amazing if people were standardized around their reporting indicators, as Lingi just spoke about. But that's a huge project, and that is something that I don't know if anybody's got right. Um, but for now, it is, it is already one step in the right direction where we can start reporting in a similar manner so that we can actually start to get glimmers of insight into what is working, what isn't, and where can we learn lessons from one another. So I think that's really the power behind this impact reporting guideline. And the second thing is that it gives the um, implementing organizations tools in their hands to be able to use to communicate the impact that they're having. And so that is really powerful. Sometimes, um, I mean, we obviously enjoy the qualitative stories that we hear and those are really important. But having something that is quantitative that people can utilize and actually have a set way of reporting is just exceptionally helpful to communicate to their different stakeholders on what the impact is that they're having and how that impact is um, contributing to strengthening the social fabric in our nation. The other thing that I have to mention before we move on to our final question is that the report is absolutely free. A nation builder is actively encouraging people to use the report, to share the report, to engage with the content. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen in other conferences, but as somebody who's exposed to a lot of events, to have an organization say, we want you to use this, we want you to share this, we want you to engage with this content, for me is quite refreshing in 2021 because it's probably the only way that we're going to get people to start thinking about collaboration as a key, but also standardization and also if I'm going to be more attractive in this current environment where there are, there's a lot of request for need, we're going to need access to information. Absolutely. I think you couldn't have said it better. Um, so we are really excited to um, hopefully be a part of um, just aiding in the collaboration that needs to take place um, that is going to help us push our nation forward um, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. For both of you, and Slingi, I'll start with you. I mean, obviously, when you do a report like this, there's a lot of stuff you know, and there's a lot of stuff that you find out. Maybe in the same way that a, a movie trailer works to kind of get people enticed into going to a cinema or to go onto Netflix to watch a movie or a series, what is one of the case stories that when you heard it, when you read it, you went like, wow, I can't believe that somebody's doing this, or I can't believe this happened? Yeah, so for me, um, a particular case story that stands out is that of 
Sam Vanetu, um, who is a foundation, they talk about their outcomes-based funding approach, which is quite innovative. It's quite new, um, particularly on our shores. Um, it's pushing the needle in terms of how we do social investments in South Africa. Um, but what I really love about moving towards a more outcomes-based funding model, um, where funding comes in in tranches based on how how closely you have actually met the outcomes that you set to achieve, is that it actually sets up the not-for-profits as experts, the experts that they are within their projects. And it, it ultimately puts the responsibility back in them in terms of achieving the outcomes in their own given way and in their own given capacity and context as well. And this is also just a reminder that funders ultimately are responsible to their stakeholders for ensuring that the funds that they grant are securing maximum value for their intended purposes. And for me, just having an outcomes-based model really shifts that conversation once again to saying, actually, we are funding towards impact. And therefore, there's no getting away from the conversation around what is the impact that our projects are, are having on the ground. Kerry Lee, for you, what was a case story that really uh, jumped out that said, wow, once somebody's going to open up this report and read it, they're going to just be blown away by this case story? So I think for me, it's the fundamentals that are showcased in the impact reporting guideline. And so a few of them are, one, the, a couple of the funders take quite a relational approach. The so Mergon Foundation takes a very relational approach to and their partnerships. And I think that's important because the not-for-profit sector truly understands what's happening on the ground. And so um, a relational approach helps you to work together as partners and um, learn from one another as you journey along um, the impact path together or impact journey together. The second thing was the um, theory of change that we are Durban um spoke about in the case story. And a theory of change is something that many people in the development sector know about. Um, but it's just such a good reminder of how important having a framework like that and making sure that that framework is um, a, a foundational document that you have in your organization so that as seasons shift, as pandemics hit, as um, different things happen within the organization, that you have a clear guide star and you know exactly what the impact is that you're hoping to achieve. And yes, you will change your activities and you'll change the way that you go about things. But you will have that very clear end goal so that you don't end up getting blown around with what comes your way over time. And so just that reminder of the importance of the theory of change and how much that assists you in measuring your impact, I think is invaluable. So um, yeah, those are definitely two of the case stories that are foundational, but at the same time, things that are such a good reminder. That was Kerry Lee Pascal, Executive Trustee of Nation Builder, along with Lengiwe Piri, Product and Community Manager at Nation Builder, talking to us ahead of the launch of the Impact Management Reporting Guideline, which is set to be available on the 25th of March. The guideline will be freely available from their website, www.proudnationbuilder.co.za.